So in the next part of the chapter, we're going to focus our attention on water and some of the really cool, unique properties that water has. And then we're going to spend the last part of the chapter talking about carbon and how carbon is essential to organic molecules. So first off, water. Water is essential to biological systems. It's essential to living organisms. In fact, it's one of the most abundant molecules not only on the planet, but also inside of our bodies in living organisms. In fact, for humans, 60%, 60 to 70 percent of the human body is composed of water. In fact, some cells are made of upwards of 90 percent water. So water is really important. Water has a lot of unique properties that give this molecule some unique characteristics. So we're going to go over that list really quickly and we'll talk about how these are relevant to living organisms. So first off, water has a high specific heat and a high heat of vaporization. We'll go over that on the next slide. Water also is probably the best thing, the closest thing we have on the planet to a universal solvent. It's a really good solvent. We'll go over that as well. Water has both cohesive as well as adhesive properties, and that makes water really um, important in some biological um, systems. And um, lastly, um, water has the capacity um, to generate pH, to regulate pH. And we'll talk about pH regulation in a couple of slides. So let's start off, maybe, okay, with talking just about some basic properties of water. Make sure I have my pen. Yeah, there we go. So we went over in the last video how water is a polar molecule. And I think we'll just draw it really quickly again. So water is made up of one molecule of oxygen covalently bonded to two molecules of hydrogen. This hydrogen is a little messy over here. <laughs> and remember these lines right here um, connecting, I'm pointing with my finger like you could see, pointing the, uh, sorry, um, attaching or connecting, bonding the oxygen and hydrogen atoms together. These lines right here represent single covalent bonds that are polar. Remember that term polar. What that means is that the electrons being shared here are not shared equally. And so therefore oxygen gets a partial negative charge, and these two hydrogens get a partial positive charge. That's going to bother me. Okay, messed that up really good. A partial positive charge. Um, and so we say that a, a molecule of water has polarity. It has regions or poles that have um, different charge or different partial charge, I should say. Okay, so that means that other molecules that are polar or completely charged, positive or negative, are going to be attracted to water. And water molecules themselves will be attracted to each other. We say that any molecule that is attracted, or any atom, ion, molecule, that is attracted to water is hydrophilic. So hydro meaning water and philic meaning liking or loving, right? And so um, hydrophilic substances are going to want to associate with water. And they're going to do that through hydrogen bonding, okay, through an attraction of either opposite charges or partially opposite poles. Molecules that do not like water are said to be hydrophobic. These are molecules that don't have any partial charge or full charge. Okay, so for example, we're going to look at some hydrophobic molecules in the next chapter. Lipids. Lipids are considered to be hydrophobic. We say that they are insoluble in water. They won't dissolve, and that's because they're not attracted to water. So they will not associate with water. They will actually physically repel it. You've probably, you know, maybe made salad dressing before. You've added water, or sorry, um, uh, oil to water or vinegar, and you notice that the oil forms droplets. Um, what the oil is doing is it's really pushing away that water. It doesn't want to be it's not attracted to it, and so the oil droplets will stay separate from uh, the water. So hydrophilic means water-loving, and that's based on charge or partial charge, and hydrophobic means um, water-fearing or not attracted to water. Okay, and again, that's going to be based on the polarity of the water molecule. So because the water molecule is polar and has partial charge, hydrophilic substances will be attracted to it. Okay. So, water is going to exist in different states. 
it can exist in a gas, as a gas, a liquid, or a solid. And interestingly, when you look at the three states and you look at hydrogen bonding and you look at the space between the molecules, it's going to become really important. So let's start off at freezing. So at zero degrees Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit, water will freeze. And so what does that mean? If we take a look at the water molecules, it kind of has this crystalline-like lattice that forms. And so remember, these red spheres are oxygens and the little blue spheres are um, hydrogens. They're going to be bonded to each other. And then between the molecules, so you can see this line right here, it's a little hard to see, that's going to represent hydrogen bonding. And so in ice, the solid form of water, what we have is we have water molecules. Each water molecule is going to be hydrogen hydrogen bonded to the maximum number of other water molecules. What does that mean? That means that each water molecule will be bonded, hydrogen bonded, to four other water molecules. So in ice, in this solid form, the water molecules are at a maximum distance from each other. They're all kind of spread out because they're hydrogen bonded. Okay, without the hydrogen bond, they can get closer to each other. So we have molecules of water, in this case, that are at the farthest distance that they can be from each other. That's really cool. If we go up to the liquid form of water, where's my pointer? Right here. So if we get above zero degrees Celsius, we start to move towards 50, you know, or less than that, we're going to have water, right? So we see that ice melts. And when ice melts, what's happening? Energy is being put into the system, but we're breaking hydrogen bonds. And so when you break those hydrogen bonds, those molecules of water actually get closer together, okay? This is really interesting because if you compare ice to liquid water, ice is less dense. See that? The water molecules are farther apart, so it's less dense, which we're going to get to in a minute. That's why ice floats. Um, it's based on density, okay? It doesn't sink when it gets in water because there's actually more space within the molecules. Okay, we'll get into that again. I'll repeat that in just a few minutes. When we look at the gaseous state, well, now all those hydrogen bonds that may have existed in liquid water, they've been broken, and the water molecules have um, um, higher energy, and they've gone, um, you know, into the gaseous state, okay? Water will boil at 100 degrees Celsius, and we'll get that conversion of liquid to gaseous um, water molecules. Okay. Okay. So great. The next slide was this one. So because ice is less dense, and it's less dense, again, because of the space between the molecules, which is shown here, uh, it's less dense than water. That allows ice to flow. Now, why is that important in a biological sense? Well, if we think about bodies of water, especially up here where we are um, in upstate New York, um, bodies of water uh, tend to freeze over in the winter, right? Um, so if you've ever been to, oh, Delta Lake, for example, or um, Lake Placid, if you've ever been to Mirror Lake up that way, right? Or any local lake, um, it's going to either fully or, or partially at least freeze over in the winter. So why is that important? So when it freezes over, it's going to be the top layers, right, of that water that freeze. And that frozen water doesn't sink to the bottom because it's less dense. It, instead, it floats on top. Now think about how important that is. If it's sunk to the bottom, then anything in those bodies of water would die, right? Um, they would freeze as well. Okay, well, they don't, right? Thankfully. So that ice that's sitting on top, because it floats, life underneath it is able to persist. What that ice on top also does is it provides a barrier, a layer of insulation, protecting the water underneath it from the cold air. And so the temperature inside those bodies of water doesn't fluctuate too much where life couldn't persist inside of them. Okay, so that's how it's important. That's how it's biologically relevant in those types of systems. Okay. So we know that ice floats. <laughs> water also has the highest specific heat of any liquid. What does that mean? 
That's the amount of energy, of heat, that has to be applied in order to get water to change temperature. That's really important on the planet. Okay, we have the sun beating down on our planet every day. A lot of that energy from the sun is reflected from our polar ice caps, which are shrinking, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and some of that water is going to be absorbed by the water on, sorry, some of that energy from the sun is going to be absorbed by the water on the planet. Now, as that energy is absorbed, if water did not have a high specific heat, then it would definitely fluctuate in temperature to a great extent. But because it has a high specific heat, it can actually um, absorb a lot of energy from the sun without changing temperature too much. So again, life is allowed to persist in aquatic environments. Um, we also have a lot of that energy, a lot of that sunlight, again, being reflected off of our polar ice caps, which keeps air temperature um, you know, relatively stable within limits, within a range to permit life uh, to exist on the planet. What else? High heat of vaporization. It takes a lot of energy to get water to actually change state, to change from solid to liquid to gas. So why is that important? Again, our polar ice caps right, are reflecting a lot of energy each day. Um, and, and unfortunately, now they're kind of shrinking, but they can take on a lot of that energy without changing from solid to liquid. Okay. Um, the same thing with our bodies of water. A lot of energy um, can be um, absorbed without losing a whole bunch of water. Okay, so our bodies of water don't change in size too much. Let's bring it to humans. Let's kind of make it relevant to us. Um, you've all sweat, right? Um, so interestingly, what's happening inside of your body uh, as you work out or if you're, if you're outside and it's hot out, um, your body temperature starts to rise. And as a mechanism to cool your body down, what happens is your body sweats, which is just your body releasing water, okay? And now when that water is released from your body, it's going to evaporate. And when it evaporates, the heat goes with it, okay? So that's really important in humans. It's called evaporative cooling. And again, that's based on water changing state from liquid to gas which has to do with this heat of vaporization, and that allows humans to maintain body temperature or homeostasis, which is one of those key characteristics that all living things share, having to maintain homeostasis. Okay, so what else? Water is the closest thing we have to the universal solvent, to a universal solvent. If something is capable of being dissolved, water is going to dissolve it. Um, we already kind of talked about this when we talked about when you put salt inside of water in the, in the first um, half of the lecture. It dissolves, right? It magically disappears. What does that mean to dissolve? So when you put salt into water, what's going to happen? So here is sodium chloride. This is the salt. Now the water molecules shown here, they're going to come over to the salt and there's going to be an attraction. So the hydrogen atoms which are positively, par partially positively charged, they're going to be attracted to and pull on and tug on the, chlor the um, chloride anions. They're gonna pull those out and here's shown here. This is called a hydration shell around the chloride. So it's just water, right? Surrounding that negatively charged ion, all of the positively, partially charged hydrogen atoms are going to be attracted to it. They form a, a, a shell of water around that. And the same thing is going to happen with the sodium, except for, for sodium, the negatively charged oxygens, that positively charged sodium atom or ion. Okay, so that is what dissolving means. Each individual ion gets surrounded by a shell of water. Okay, and water can do this to any charged or partially charged particle or ion or molecule. Um, oh, really quick, I want to introduce you to some terms here. So a solution is a mixture of a solute and a solvent, okay? What are those? So the solvent is um, whatever is doing the dissolving. It's usually the, the, the molecules that are there in greater number. In this case, in our example here, the solvent is water, okay? And in lab in a couple of weeks, you're going to do um, 
an osmosis lab and you're going to be using sugar water. Okay. Um, the water will be the solvent. The solute is going to be sugar or we're going to be actually using corn syrup, which is sugar. Okay. So the solute is whatever is being dissolved. In the case here in this figure with salt, um, the, so the salt, the sodium and the chloride ions are going to be the solute. So the solvent is whatever is doing the dissolving and the, um, sorry, the solvent is whatever is doing the dissolving and the solute is whatever is being dissolved. Okay, water also displays the property of being cohesive and that creates something called surface tension. So that's what that, what's on this slide. So what is cohesion? So remember we talked about water molecules being attracted to each other and being able to form hydrogen bonds between water molecules. That's attraction of water molecules to each other. In water, in, in, in liquid water, if you look at the surface in a glass of water or the surface of a pond or a lake or even a puddle, the surface of that water is going to display something called surface tension, okay? Surface tension is gonna be the capacity of a substance, in this case water, to withstand breaking when placed under tension or stress. So it's gonna take a little bit to break the surface of the water. Now in this particular picture here, we have a sewing needle and it's been placed very carefully onto water, a glass of water, okay? And this looks like a measuring cup in this figure. Now notice how I said very carefully because you, if you're not careful enough, you'll break the, the surface and it will just sink to the bottom, okay? How is it important in a biological sense? So there are many organisms that live in environments where they have to get out onto water in order to feed or to reproduce. Like for example, this water spider here or this water strider being pictured here. They can literally walk on water and that is due to surface tension. Okay. Notice they don't sink. They're able to physically walk on the surface of that water. Again, that's due to water tension and that's due to cohesion. The water molecules are sticking together, forming this layer of tension. Okay, what else? Adhesion. So not only can water molecules stick to each other, but they can stick to other surfaces. Again, based on hydrogen bonding. That's, so adhesion is the attraction of water to other molecules or surfaces. If you've ever taken a capillary tube, a thin hollowed out tube, and put it into water, you may have noticed that the water starts to climb a little bit above the surface of the water in the container. How does it do that against gravity? That's called capillary action. And that is due to cohesion, water molecules sticking to each other, and adhesion, water molecules sticking to the side of that capillary tube, okay? How is that biologically relevant? We're gonna get into this towards the end of the semester when we talk about plants. Um, capillary action, cohesion, and adhesion are extremely important in plants. So plants like this tree here, pictured in this picture, they need water, okay, to live. They need water all the way up at the tippy tops of, uh, of the tree where there are leaves that are doing photosynthesis. They need water to get there. How is water gonna get there? Water is going to be absorbed from the ground through roots, and then it has, it has to climb the tree and get all the way to the top where it's gonna be used in photosynthesis. And it has to do that without the expenditure of energy. Okay, so how does that happen? So water is gonna enter in to the roots and it's gonna enter into specialized tubes that literally look like capillary tubes called xylem. Okay, it's not on the slide, can, the term's not too important, we'll talk about it towards the end of the semester. But if we took a peek here inside the trunk of the tree, we would see all these xylem tubes, all these fat tubes here, they're all going to be responsible for moving water, conducting water. And these cells are actually dead at maturity. So they're literally just tubes going all the way from the roots all the way up to the leaves of the plant. So how does water move through them? Water molecules are gonna to stick to each other 
and they're going to stick to the sides of those xylem tubes, and they're literally going to kind of climb up, okay, based on those interactions of cohesion and adhesion. And water does get pulled out at the top of the plant. So up here, where photosynthesis is happening inside of the leaves, water is also being pulled out, and that's going to be driven by the sun, okay? Um, and so as water molecules are pulled out, they're going to also be being pulled up. And that pulling force, as long as none of the, the hydrogen bonds between the molecules break too much, um, they're going to pull on the water molecule below them. So it's kind of a tugging action. Again, based full, totally on cohesion and, ad and adhesion, which happens because of the polarity of the water molecule all because electrons are not shared equally between hydrogen and oxygen. You get all these really unique properties. It's pretty cool. Okay, so you want to pause your presentation here, and you want to go ahead and answer these questions. And when you're done, you want to come back. I've got some more questions for you. Okay, so let's answer some questions together. So the first one, which of the following explains why there is an attraction of water molecules to each other. Pink, the nonpolar covalent bonds found within each molecule. Blue, the polar covalent bonds found within each molecule. No, within water molecules. Green, the ionic bonds found within water molecules. Or yellow, the hydrocarbon bonds found within water molecules. I'll give you a minute to think about that one. Okay, so it's blue. The polar covalent bonds found within water molecules. Okay, because of that, you end up with partially charged regions, which then allow for hydrogen bonding between water molecules. Second question, why does ice float in water? So the first one says in red, the high surface tension of liquid water keeps the ice on top. Blue, the ionic bonds within the molecules of ice prevent ice from sinking. Green, ice always has air bubbles in it that keep it afloat. Or yellow, high bonds stabilize and keep water molecules of ice farther apart and therefore less dense than the water molecules of liquid water. I'll give you a minute to think about that. And you can pause me too if you time. So the answer is yellow. So ice is going to be less dense because of the distance there between molecules of water and ice because of those hydrogen bonds, okay? There's the maximum amount of hydrogen bonding when we look at solid water or ice. Okay. Okay. You guys have probably heard the question, is water wet? And hopefully by now you know that, yes, water is wet. And that has to do with polarity of the molecule. It has to do with hydrogen bonding and attraction and hydrophilic nature of water. So yeah, I would say that water is wet. <laughs> okay, so the next part of this chapter, we're just gonna briefly talk about pH buffers and acids and bases, okay? And this is because reactions are happening inside of our bodies all the time. And so it's really important to understand um, what's kind of regulating uh, of that. Um, we don't want huge drastic pH changes to happen inside of our body. We would fall out of homeostatic range if that happened. And so therefore, we're going to talk about buffers, okay? Um, um, so let's start off with pH. So if we're talking about pH, and there's various pHs that exist inside of your body depending on where we're looking, okay? pH is going to be a measurement of the hydrogen ion concentration in a substance, okay? The hydrogen ion, let me write it for us, is gonna be represented by H plus. That's the hydrogen ion. So a pH is a measure of that. An acid 
is going to be something that increases the hydrogen ion concentration of a substance, okay, of a, of a, of a liquid, of a solution. So again, an acid is going to be a substance that's going to disassociate to yield hydrogen ions and an anion, which in essence is saying we're going to increase the concentration of hydrogen ions, H pluses. So let's take a look here. An acid is going to disassociate, come apart, to yield a hydrogen ion. There's that H plus. So the amount or the concentration of H pluses is going up. And an anion, which you know is a negatively charged ion. Okay, here's an example of an acid, hydrochloric acid or HCl. It's going to disassociate to yield hydrogen ions and chloride ions. So hydrochloric acid is going to increase the concentration of H pluses in a solution or hydrogen ions in a solution, making it more acidic. Okay, we'll talk about what that, where that, what that means for pH in just a second. A base is the opposite. Um, and there's two ways that a base could work. A base could be a substance that disassociates or comes apart in solution to yield a hydroxide ion and a cation. We could say it that way. But really what we're saying is that um, what's going to happen is there's going to be a decrease in the amount of hydrogen ions. So let me write that. So a base is going to increase the amount of hydroxide ions, which are OH negatives. And that's going to mean that there's going to be a decrease in the amount of hydrogen ions. OK? So an acid increases the hydrogen ion concentration, where a base decreases the hydrogen ion concentration. A typical base we've got here is sodium hydroxide, or NaOH, sodium hydroxide. In solution, it will disassociate to form sodium, Na+, there's my cation, and OH negative, which is the hydroxide ion. So it's going to raise the hydroxide ion concentration. Now the hydroxide ion, uh, acts as a base by associating with and bonding to hydrogen ions in the solution to form water, okay? So OH negative plus H plus is gonna give you water. So in essence, what just happened is this base decreased the concentration of H pluses, which are hydrogen ions, okay? So acids increase, hydrogen ion concentration, and bases decrease hydrogen ion concentration, okay? And water can actually disassociate and can increase H+, plus, or as we showed right here, we can have this happen to, to form water. So water can act um, as an acid or a base, really, in this situation, okay? And water will dissociate. Um, and then it'll reassociate, reassociate. Okay, so it can do both. It can give off H pluses and it can decrease the amount of H pluses. Okay, let me move this here. Okay, so the pH scale. Let's start in the middle. So a neutral pH is a pH of 7. And at neutral pH, the amount of hydrogen, hydrogen? ions is equal to the amount of hydroxide ions. That would be a neutral pH, a pH of 7. Distilled water is around there, right? Because water is going to disassociate and reassociate, but at any given moment, there should be an equal number of those. And so distilled water, okay, is going to be rated about a pH of 7. Okay, as we move, okay, so before we go any further, the pH scale goes from 0 to 14, okay? As we move, let's go, let's say below seven first. As we move below seven, so a pH of six or five or four or three, two, one, those are going to be, we're getting more and more acidic as we move down the pH scale towards zero, okay? 
So, again, an acidic solution is going to have a pH less than 7. What does that mean? That means that the hydrogen ion concentration in an acidic solution is going to be greater than the hydroxide ion concentration. Okay? So what are some things that are acidic that raise the hydrogen concentration and therefore decrease the pH? Urine has a pH of about 6. It's slightly acidic. Black coffee, tomato juice has a pH of 4. It's pretty acidic. If we go down, your stomach acids, so gastric acid means acids in your stomach, they have a pH of 1. That's a pretty acidic environment. And it needs to be kept at a pH of 1 in order for your stomach to do its job. So those gastric juices, right, they're going to require um, an acidic environment in order to break down food. Okay? The enzymes that work in that environment require an acidic pH in order to operate. The opposite of an acidic solution is a basic solution, right? And so if we go up our pH scale towards 14, we're becoming more basic. Um, the, in a basic solution, or as we go up that scale, what we're going to find is the hydrogen ion concentration is going to become less and less compared to the hydroxide ion concentration. Okay, so as we move up, we got seawater, baking soda, milk of magnesia, if you've ever taken that for a stomach ache, um, soapy water, bleach, ammonia, those are all going to be on the basic side of the scale. We can also use the term alkaline, um, and alkaline and basic pretty much mean the same thing. A basic solution is an alkaline solution. Okay, I wanted to give you a little kind of picture to go with those words to show you hydrogen and hydroxide ion concentrations in these different environments. And so a neutral solution, if you were to count up the number of hydroxide, OH negative, and hydrogen, H positive ions, you would find there's an equal number, where in an acidic solution, there's a lot more H pluses, okay, a lot more hydrogen ions compared to hydroxide ions. And on the other side, in a basic solution, there's a whole lot more um, hydroxide ions compared to hydrogen ions. Okay, so remember neutral, pH is going to be about 7. Below that, so below 7 is acidic, and above 7 is basic. Okay, so chemical reactions are taking place inside of your body all the time, inside of your cells, and that might throw pH off, right? If you have something that is producing a lot of hydrogen ions, that's going to create an acidic environment. So how does your body, how do your cells regulate that? There are these things called buffers. So a buffer is going to be a substance which is going to um, help to maintain homeostatic pH, okay? maintain appropriate pH values so that your cells and tissues are not damaged. Um, for example, your human blood is pretty neutral. It has a pH of about 7.4. Your, your blood has to maintain that pH or else your blood cells will start to die. So there's a very narrow limit there um, that's going to be okay, that's going to be in homeostatic range, we would say, in order to keep you alive. So again, a buffer is going to be a substance that's going to resist changes in pH. You can add it to an acid or a base to try to help minimize um, those changes. Here's an example. Um, this is a buffer that's used inside of your bodies. It's found in your bloodstream, um, and it helps to maintain pH. It's called carbonic acid. Okay, this right here on the, on the um, left-hand side. This is carbonic acid. It's an acid. Okay, so if there is um, a rise in pH, if the pH is starting to become basic, it's starting to get up there above 7, oh my God, it's reaching 8, what's going to happen is this buffer is going to act as an acid. It's going to disassociate. Okay, so we'll have this here. And look, there's the hydrogen ion. So it's going to release hydrogen ions, which is going to cause your pH to come down, to go towards the acidic side. Now, let's say that there is 
too much of a drop in pH, your bloodstream is becoming acidic, it's falling below 7.4, well, the opposite's going to happen. This right here is going to act as a base. It's going to associate with the hydrogen ion, and we're going to move in this direction. Look, this is a reversible reaction. And we're going to reform carbonic acid. Okay, so that is a buffer. Again, it will disassociate or reassociate in response to changes in pH to help you to keep a pH around neutral in your bloodstream. Okay, so go ahead and pause our video here and you're gonna answer these couple of questions. And when you're finished, come on back, I have a couple questions for you. Okay, let me move my picture here. So the first question, which of the following statement is true? Red, acids and bases cannot mix together. Blue, acids but not bases can change the pH of a solution. Green, acids donate hydroxide ions. Bases donate hydrogen ions. Or yellow, bases donate hydroxide ions and acids donate hydrogen ions. Take a minute. Okay, so hopefully you answered yellow. Bases increase the concentration of hydroxide. Acids increase the concentration of hydrogen. Next question. When acids are added to a solution, the pH should, should it decrease, increase, stay the same, or can we not tell without testing? So hopefully you answered decrease. Okay, last section of the chapter. We're gonna be talking about carbon and organic macromolecules. So there are four classes of organic macromolecules that are going to be important in biological systems. They're going to make up cells. We've got proteins, nucleic acids, carbohydrates, and lipids, and we're gonna spend all of the next chapter, chapter three, talking about each of those. But before we do, we need to understand a little bit more about carbon. So when you hear the term organic, I want you to think carbon. Organic compounds are carbon-based. You've got to think back to where carbon is on the periodic table and understand carbon's valence as well. So let's do that really quick. We've got the atomic symbol for carbon is C. Its atomic number is six and its atomic mass is, well, not exactly 12, but around 12, okay? I'm a biologist, not a chemist, so 12 is good enough for me. So let's draw an electron shell diagram now for carbon. So again, there's my atomic nucleus. I've got my first shell. It's going to hold two electrons. My second shell will hold the remaining four, and I'm gonna put them in one at a time in four locations. And so we say that carbon has a valence of four and those four electrons are unpaired. And so carbon is gonna to wanna to participate in four bonds and the type of bonds that carbon will participate in are covalent bonds. Okay, so the first group of molecules that I wanna introduce you to before we talk about carbohydrates and lipids and nucleic acids and proteins in the next chapter are the hydrocarbons. And next week in lab, you're gonna actually spend a lot of time, well, you would have been building them, but this time you're gonna be drawing them. Um, so the hydrocarbons, the name is a little bit confusing because when you see hydro, you probably think water, but in this case, it's not water. So hydrocarbons are gonna be organic molecules made up of carbon and hydrogen atoms, okay? Not water molecules. Um, there's a couple of classes of hydrocarbons. There's the alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. In lab, you're going to be drawing the alkanes and the alkenes, and so that's what we're going to stick to for lecture as well. 
So again, these are going to be molecules made up of purely carbon and hydrogen. These can be straight chain molecules, which are called aliphatic hydrocarbons, or they can be in rings, which are called aromatic hydrocarbons. Okay, there's a couple listed here. Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> a couple listed here for you. Um, so again, in lab, you're going to build a lot of these. Um, let me just go through some of these with you. So first off, for the alkanes, when you see that, these are going to be hydrocarbons that have all single covalent bonds between the carbon atoms. Okay, that's important. Where the alkenes, these have at least one double bond in the molecule. The ones that we're going to build, just, just one double bond. So the alkanes have all single bonds. The alkenes have a double bond. Let's look at some of these. So the first alkane that you're going to look at in lab is going to be this one right here, methane. The prefix meth means one carbon. And again, that ending ane tells you it's an alkane, all single bonds. Okay. The molecular formula for methane is CH4. And then I'm going to draw for you the structural formula. So it's going to be carbon covalently bonded. That line I'm drawing represents a covalent bond. Covalently bonded to four hydrogens. So that's the structural formula for methane. The second alkane in that series is ethane. That's right here. That prefix eth means two carbons. And again, the ending ane tells you that it's an alkane. And the ball and stick model for that is right here for you. Okay, and look at the formula, the molecular formula here is C2H6. The third alkane, which is not on here, is called propane. So that prefix prop means three carbons. And again, the ending ane tells you that there's all single bonds. Okay, now I could draw the structural formula for propane and figure out the molecular formula from that, or I can use this formula, CnH2n plus 2. So for the alkanes, you can use that formula right there. That means for every carbon, there's 2 times plus 2 for our hydrogens. So you take the number of carbons equals your n, and you just plug that in. So let's do it for propane. Think about that. So for propane, n equals 3. So you're going to have C3, H, it's going to be 2 times 3 is 6, plus 2 is 8. Okay, so without even knowing the structure, I can already come up with the molecular formula just based on um, the formula that I've given you here. So for all of the alkanes, it's going to be Cn, H2n, plus 2. Now in lab next week, you're going to draw these up to the fourth. So it's meth, methane, <laughs> um, ethane, propane, and the fourth one is butane. So but means four. Okay. Um, when you get up to butane, I'm going to go to the next slide for a second, and then we'll come back to this one. When you get to butane, there's two ways that you can draw it. I'm going to move this down here for a second. And there's those are actually here at the top. So this is one way, and this is a second way. Do you see the difference? So the first on the left, that's just a straight chain of carbons. It's one carbon bonded to the next, where the one on the right looks different. It's the same number of carbons, the same number of hydrogens, but instead of being a linear straight chain, it's what we call a branched hydrocarbon. These are structural isomers. Okay, see that term isomer? Sometimes students get confused with isotope. This is different. An isomer, here's the definition. These are going to be molecules that have the same molecular formula. So they have the same number and types of atoms, but they have a different arrangement of those atoms. Okay, and so the first type are structural isomers. Different, different structural arrangement of the atoms. So in, 
they'll behave differently in biological systems. So um, on the left, you've got butane, that straight chain, and on the right, you've got isobutane. It's the isomer of it. Okay, I don't want you to worry too much about naming when we get to this, um, but just realize that they are isomers. Same number and types of atoms, different structural arrangement. Let me go back to the previous slide and then we'll come back again. Okay, I'm going to erase some of this real quick. Okay, so those are the alkanes, all single bonds between the carbons. When you get up to four carbons, you start to have isomers, structural isomers. The next series that we're going to work with are the alkenes. Notice the ending E-N-E. -E. That tells you that there's a double bond in the molecule. So between two carbon atoms, there's going to be a double bond, two pairs of electrons being shared. In this series, we start off with ethene. There's no methene, because meth means one carbon, you can't have a double bond. So the first in the series is ethene, and that's shown here. Okay, so eth still means two carbons. The ending ene means that there's a double bond. And so here you can see um, the structure of that molecule. The molecular formula is here. C2H4. And we can come up with a formula for these just like we did for the alkanes. It's going to be CnH2n. So for every carbon, there's two hydrogens. Pretty easy, right? So in lab, you're going to draw ethene. You're going to draw propene. And when you get above propene, it gets a little tricky because Let's come back here to our isomer slide. You can end up with the second type of isomer, which are called geometric isomers. In geometric isomers, you have a different arrangement of atoms around a double bond. Okay, so again, molecular formula is the same, same number and types of atoms, but there's a different arrangement of those atoms around the double bond. So let's look first here at the first type of butene. Notice how we have a double bond and we have the CH3 groups below the double bond. Both of them are below it. Look at the other one, the other, uh, the transbutene. Do you see how one CH3 is below and one is above? So I'm talking about these groups right here. Those are both below. One's below and one's above. We call the first conformation, the first type, we say that they are in cis. Cis means the same side of the double bond. Where the second type, they are in trans. And that means a different side, two different sides of that double bond. They're on opposite sides of that double bond. Okay, those terms are going to come into play again when we get into lipids. We're going to talk about cis and trans. You've probably heard that. You've heard of um, um, trans fats. Okay, you've heard of saturated, unsaturated, and then trans probably. We don't hear too much about cis fats. You want to stay away from trans fats. It's all about how molecules are arranged around a double bond. See how everything comes back to, to chemistry, <laughs> to atoms and molecules. Okay, so we know that isomers can exist in the structural form and in the geometric form. I'm going to leave the enantiomers for just a second Oop. and come back here. Okay, so we went over the alkanes. And we went over the alkenes. I just want to show you the cyclical structures. And you're going to actually build this one, cyclohexane, or build, draw, cyclohexane in the lab. So oftentimes, if you have a straight chain hydrocarbon, it's not very stable, especially in aqueous environments. It's kind of flimsy and floppity. And so what will happen is it will form a ring structure. Okay? Um, you're going to see this when we get into, for example, looking at carbohydrates. Glucose is a great example of a linear molecule that's just not stable, so it forms a ring. Um, so you'll, we'll come back to that again. Okay, so hydrocarbons can exist in straight chains or in rings. Okay, so we went over the, the basic definition for isomers. We talked about structural isomers versus geometric isomers. And the last type of isomer I want to mention to you, this last term down here, which is fun to say, enantiomers. These are going to be, they're not necessarily just hydrocarbons, 
um, they can have they have other groups on them as well or other atoms on them as well they're going to be molecules that are mirror images of each other like a left and right hand okay they're molecules that have the same number and types of atoms but they're different from each other they're mirror images you can't put one on top of the other and have it fit perfectly so they're actually different molecules and they're going to behave differently in biological systems. Okay. Okay. Let me give you an example of this. Um, there's a drug that's used to, to treat Parkinson's disease. It's called DOPA. And when they make this drug synthetically, um, it's made um, of a certain number and type of atoms, but they end up with two mirror images, two enantiomers, two isomers. When, when they make it, they make, when they make it, they end up with what's called L-DOPA and D-DOPA. And both are made, um, but only one of them is biologically active. The other one doesn't do anything. If you put it into an, or, you know, into a person who has Parkinson's, it doesn't work. And that's um, because it's a different molecule. So only one form of DOPA actually works. So as they make it synthetically, um, they have to, um, you know, keep that in mind that, that, some of the drug that they're making is not going to work, and so they don't want to give that to patients. Okay, so that brings us to functional groups. So hydrocarbons, molecules just made of carbon and hydrogen, um, they don't usually exist by themselves in living organisms. They don't have functional relevance. They don't do anything inside of living organisms. However, many of the macromolecules that we're going to talk about have large regions made up of carbon and hydrogen okay but they also have functional groups and it's the functional groups that make them biologically active so i want to go over this list of functional groups that give these um, macromolecules functional relevance chemical properties in, in living organisms so the first one i want to talk about is the hydroxyl group which is also called the alcohol group that's used interchangeably. So hydroxyl and alcohol group, same thing. That's the OH group. Okay, where's my pointer? So it's going to be an atom of oxygen bonded to an atom of hydrogen. And then this will be bonded to something else. So if you look up here, you see this R? That's, you know, a hydrocarbon region um, that this hydroxyl group ends up on. And again, you're going to make some of these in lab, so hopefully it's going to solidify um, your understanding of them. Now, this, this um, bond right here between the O and the H, that's a covalent bond. But oftentimes, it's, it's shown here in this chart, but oftentimes it's not written. So you might see the shorthand of this. This is an open bond that I just drew and an OH. Okay, either way is acceptable. That's the hydroxyl group. This line here, this open bond, this represents an electron that's waiting to be shared with some other molecule. Okay, so it's going to be added to something. Now, adding a hydroxyl group onto a hydrocarbon is going to create polarity. Remember, oxygen likes to pull on electrons, so it's going to create a partially charged region of the molecule. Some other groups that I just want to touch on um, you're going to build the methyl group. Methyl is methane with one less hydrogen, so it's CH3. Okay, it's a nonpolar group. The carbonyl, you're not going to build it in lab. However, it is important, and you will see it in other, um, when we get into chapter three in lecture. Let me just erase. Okay. Um, so the carbonyl is going to be a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, and that could be in the middle of a molecule or at the end of a molecule, okay? Again, that's going to create polarity, partial charge, which gives the molecules some chemical properties. It's going to be more likely to interact with other molecules. The carboxyl group you will build in lab, or draw, I should say, in lab. The carboxyl group is a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, and also bonded to an OH group, okay? And then again, this R represents bonded to some other molecule. So this is a group that gets added 
to a molecule. Again, that's going to confer polarity. The amino group is going to become really important. Um, the amino group is, is the NH2 group. It's going to be a nitrogen bonded to two hydrogen atoms. The phosphate group you're not going to work with in lab. It consists of phosphorus double bonded to an oxygen um, and then single bonded to an oxygen and bonded to two OH groups. Okay, uh, we will see the, ph the phosphate group when we look at, um, you know, for example, DNA. Um, this does create polarity and it actually creates some full charge. In aqueous solutions, these hydrogen atoms actually will come off as H pluses and we end up with negatively charged regions to our molecule, which makes DNA negatively charged, which is a pretty cool property. The last group down here, the sulfhydryl group, um, you won't be creating this in lab either. This contains sulfur bonded to a hydrogen. Again, it creates some polarity on the molecule because sulfur is a little bit more electronegative than the hydrogen atom. Okay, so you'll be building some of these functional groups in lab. Okay. So here is our last little bit of are you with me? So you want to go ahead and pause the video and answer these and then come back because I have some questions for you. Okay, so here's some questions. The first one, each carbon molecule can bond with as many as blank other atoms or molecules. Can carbon bond to one, two, six, or four other atoms or molecules? Hopefully you answered four, and my follow-up question is why? And you should be able to tell me that carbon has four unpaired valence electrons in its outermost shell or valence shell. And it wants a full shell, which would be eight. So it's going to participate in four covalent bonds where it's going to share electrons. And so it had four. It's sharing four more. That's eight. So then it'll be happy. The second question here, which of the following, that's a child, sorry, <laughs> which of the following is not a functional group that can bond with carbon? So the first one, so we got sodium, hydroxyl, phosphate, or carbonyl. So which of these could not bond to carbon? And hopefully you answered sodium. So how do you know that? Well, because sodium participates in ionic bonds. Remember that sodium has um, one uh, valence electron, so it's going to give that electron up. Sodium doesn't participate in covalent bonds. And carbon only participates in covalent bonds. And so the answer there is sodium. Here's another couple questions for you. The first one, the molecular formula for butane is, okay, so the prefix but means four, and the suffix ain means it's an alkane all single bonds, and so you're going to use this formula, CnH2n plus two. You're going to get lots of practice with this in lab next week, too. And so hopefully you know that n equals four here. And so if n equals 4, then 4 times 2 is 8, plus 2 is 10. So it would be C4H10, which is in yellow. Okay. Uh, last question here. Research indicates that ibuprofen, um, or Advil, a drug to use to relieve inflammation and pain, is a mixture of two enantiomers. What does that mean? So red. They have identical chemical formulas, but differ in branching of their carbon skeletons. Blue, have the same molecular formula, but are mirror images of one another. Green, exist in either linear chain or ring forms. Or yellow, differ in the location of their double bonds. Hopefully you answered blue. They have the same molecular formula, but they are mirror images of each other. Okay, that is the end of the slideshow. Um, so at this point, you should be done with the Are You With Me's, the in-class assessment. So you want to make sure that you upload those right to Blackboard. Um, and then you want to make sure that you do some studying. 
before you take the chapter two quiz.